Hey everyone, welcome to Flywheel, your number one source for everything Frax, DeFi, and everything in between. If you want to know what's going on in the world on chain, you've come to the right place. This is DeFi Dave here with Capital K, and we're here to help you harness the power of the Flywheel. And on this episode, we helped you harness the power of the legal Flywheel with honestly, like super enthusiastic, really fun attorney. You know, you can tell he has a lot of passion mm -hmm. for his work and what he does. Alex from Umami, uh, uh, the chief legal officer of Umami Labs. Um, Kit, what do you think of this episode? Man, he is a stellar legal eagle. He, he really yeah. gets down to it. And I, I have this sense of like, fight the man in him too, you know? And, oh and yeah, for sure. shows from his background of like, you know, taking on the federal government more, more time than once. Mm -hmm. Very fitting uh, for this industry of like, you know, sticking up to what you believe in, sticking up for self-sovereignty, um, you know, seeing like where kind of like things lie within the law, whether it's, you know, and whatnot. Um, I really enjoyed this one as like the almost lawyer in me because I almost, you know, I did take the LSAT. Yeah. I thought I was going to go to law school and I decided not to. I realized that was not the journey for me at the time. And so, but I realized like, hey, like being in crypto for a bit, I'm like, hey, honestly, like, I think it, I find this stuff really interesting, especially all the securities law, like all the intricacies, the gray area here and there, um, you know, and he like lives that life. And like he said, um, it was really interesting because he, we have like, we work in crypto, but we have like, we do think about this stuff a lot from a legal perspective, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's in our back of our heads, whether it's like anxiety ridden or like pure, like intellectual curiosity driven. And he is a lawyer. So he's like, think of this for his day job every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think for the listeners, especially if you listen towards the end part, like Alex really gives you some good tidbits and advice to kind of get after it. So I, I would highly recommend you guys to stick it out to the end. Yeah, like I think every part of this interview had its like gold, it's like crumbs of gold. And like it mm -hmm. covered so many different areas. Like it covered DeFi regulation, it covered stable coins, it covered NFTs, it covered UkiDAO. Really well-rounded interview. Covered Puerto Rico and covered Switzerland. We were out in yeah. Zug at some point. We were, we were. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And if you want to continue going all around the world and all around of DeFi with us, make sure you hit that bell button. Subscribe. Let us know in the comments what you think. I really want to know what you think of Flywheel. We just did a rebrand. Do you like it? Do you not? Let us know in the comments. Give us a like. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Flywheel Fi. We just changed it at to at Flywheel Fi. Make sure you follow us on Telegram at Flywheel Fi. That's Flywheel F I. Flywheel Fi. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at DeFi Day Twenty Two. You can follow me at zero x capital underscore k. And let's get the flywheel spinning. Do you hold ETH but don't know what to do with it? Want to earn those juicy liquid staking derivative yields but don't know where to start? Well, Frax ETH is there for you. Frax ETH is Frax's native LSD solution, allowing you to earn boosted yields in multiple ways on your ETH. If you want to get started, go to app.frax.finance and turn your ETH into Frax ETH today. Thank you, everyone, for joining this episode of Flywheel Pod. I'm very excited to have on the lawyer for... Wait, can you give us like a... You're, you're the umami lawyer, right? Or is it umami or uki? So, so, so both, actually. So my, my main... You're both. Yeah, my main um, role is I'm actually the chief legal officer of Umami Labs, which is the service company mm -hmm. that supports Umami DAO. Um, mm -hmm. And we were greatly interested in the Uki DAO case just because, like, it kind of impacts everybody in the space. And so I actually worked with um, LexPunk to uh, file an amicus brief in the Uki DAO case. Um, so... That, okay. The Ugi Dao was kind of like moonlighting for me, you know, but but mm -hmm. uh, so my main my main job is is working at a, at Umami Labs, which is a, of course a, a real pleasure and an honor to work with those guys, yeah. and uh, I, I greatly appreciate that um, they kind of give me the bandwidth to go do stuff like, hey, let's file an amicus in Ugi because it is cool. Space. Yeah. So, Alec Golubitsky, Chief Legal Officer. Gal Did I say that right? Golubitsky. Yeah. Galubisky, yeah, Alex Galubisky, Chief Legal Officer of Umami Labs. It's funny we had on uh, Alex a while ago, and that was the uh, Real Yield episode that actually became a meme of its own. Like the <laughs> client ended up writing an article about it, 
and became, real yield became a trend. And now you have like a bunch of delta neutral strategy attempts out there, including umamis. In, including um, umami, yeah, it's kind of wild how that. It, yeah, real yield definitely became a, a meme, and now it's almost like you sort of stay away from the term just because, uh, just because yeah. like it's got bagging. But I mean, like the the, mm -hmm. the reality is is that it was a good idea for 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 DeFi, and it still is, whatever you call it. You know, like that people should be. We should have protocols that are actually sustainable. Yeah. Businesses. Yeah, as with our um, interview with Chainlink God last week, a big theme of it, it was DeFi and crypto maturing out of being a shitcoin casino to having real world use cases and actually making an impact in people's like everyday lives, whether it's consumer or B two B or any anywhere in between. And I just want to like get in a big part of that happening, and the one of the big ways that's going to happen is if things get cleared up legally and regulatory wise and along that front with I, I remember hearing back in uh i was at devcon i went to a talk and they talked about how like before every like major revolution in technology like for it to get to the next level there was regulatory clarity whether it was like radio or tv mm -hmm. or the internet and now crypto has been kind of in this gray area for a really long time uh i want to know like what do you think of that statement and like where do you think like crypto goes from here it's still in this gray area gray area and like how do you feel about everything right now yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's that's generally true that, that technology moves faster than regulation as it should, and so mm -hmm. you end up, you know, crypto is in in, in some ways in in a unique um, situation, but in other ways that there are, you know, h historical um, analogies to to the position the industry is in, and uh, you know, my biggest concern is. There are people, you know, in D.C. and state legislatures who, under the guise of regulation, are really, really just sort of want to shut the industry down. And I think that 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 is dangerous. Um, I mean, I think it's also too late, right, if they want to or not. It's not mm -hmm. that Jimmy's not going back in the bottle. Um, but, you know, and, and, I, and I do hope that um, going forward, we have um, sort of more common sense regulation and that will require sort of give and take on both sides, right? I mean, I think that within the industry, you know, we have to accept that regulation will involve making some things that did not used to be difficult to do more difficult, right? Because that that's part of regulation is, is there's this red tape, there's somebody looking over your shoulder. And, um, and, and you know, I, I do think that, you know, for, for the people, the sort of privacy maxis out there who are obviously uh, justifiably, you know, you know, attracted to, uh, to, to crypto generally, um, a lot of the regulation just looks all bad, right? Because, because you're just, the whole concept from that perspective is we don't want the government involved at all. But I, I don't mm. think that's actually the dominant view in the industry. I, th I think that the dominant view in the industry is like any other industry, you know, we have to work with the regulators. If you work against the regulators, it, it makes your life really difficult. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that most people in the industry actually want to see some, you know, some consumer protection, some protections for 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 users. Although, you know, it's it is a uh, it's hard in our industry, right? Because like the whole point of crypto, the whole point of self custody is you don't have the guardrail. You know, if you fire your ETH off to the wrong address, like there's no undo button. And if there was an undo Guilty. button, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the same at all. You know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's really interesting because crypto, like at its genesis and the whole point of it is being sovereign, being self-sovereign, being self-sovereign, you know, with your money, being self-sovereign with your actions. That's really like the, I really view that as the basis of crypto. And, you know, unless you like get on exchanges and like third parties and stuff like that, it's, you know, it's kind of like just still the wild west in a sense, but in other ways, it's not the wild west and it's actually extremely regulated. For example, with being an American with taxes and like, keeping track of everything this and that that is like being able to like adhere i i always wonder how like funds like keep track of everything because i know like individually talking to people it's a lot especially if you do like the more farming you do this and that like you have to be and, and you know depending on like which country you're in you have to be careful yeah well it's it's funny right i mean because like in some sense the technology could be harnessed to make a lot of that, that stuff easier. I, I, we were having a I was having a conversation with our accountant at Umami, and I and you know 
they are uh, relatively new to the crypto space, but 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 we like working with them, and they're good accountants. And you know, I was I was showing them some um, just just uh, CSVs that I downloaded off of Arbiscan for one of our wallets, and mm -hmm. and and the bookkeeper was like, "Oh, this is fantastic! Like like how you know how did you how did you put this spreadsheet together?" I'm like, "Dude, I didn't." Like you could go download this <laughs> off of Arbiscan right now. You know the information is just is just out there. You know, and and it's uh, mm -hmm. and so you know I think that it's going to be decades if the if for the IRS to catch up if, if if they ever do in terms of like actually using the technology to to like yeah. actively assess taxes. But um, it, at this rate, at this rate, yeah. I, I mean, the IRS has always been slow to to. Uh, uh, you know, adapt to new technology. They still, this is funny, right? The IRS still uses fax machines, right? Nobody uses a fax machine. And so, uh, you know, before I came in with Umami Labs, I had a relatively like thriving tax practice. So I interface with the IRS a lot. And when you call the IRS, you got to fax some stuff, you know, da 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 da. And it would crack me up because for the last like 10 years or so, I would fax something to the IRS. But what's actually happening is my computer is pretending to be a fax machine. So they can talk to the IRS's computer, which is also pretending to be a fax machine. And it's like, guys, at what point are we just going to give up the picture <laughs> that we're faxing each other? You know, I'm just sending you a document <laughs> over a computer network like anybody, like anything else, you know? Yeah. Can we actually get into kind of your background uh, and what you were doing before crypto and how did you end up going from having this thriving tax practice to being a crypto lawyer in the trenches? Yeah. So, so my... Um, I've been practicing law for about 16 years, and um, uh, initially I had sort of a more general tax practice, kind of tax controversies, like kind of small scale chippy stuff. And then I got involved with the firm in the U.S. Virgin Islands in 2013 that, um, uh, you know, basically is involved with all aspects of U.S. territorial income tax credit. So the, the Virgin Islands are a territory of the United States. They use what's called the mirror system of taxation, which is basically, they have their own tax system, but it looks like the Internal Revenue Code. And they're allowed by Congress to create tax incentives for people who live in the Virgin Islands. And um, they're generous tax incentives. It's a 90% tax credit. And, uh, and so the IRS heavily scrutinizes it. And so I got involved initially on on the controversy side so representing people who were going to court because the irs had assessed the tax against them basically saying they weren't residents of the u.s virgin islands and, and through that i got more involved with the planning side and uh I, I love litigation i really my passion is litigating against the federal government which is why i was chomping at the <laughs> um and and so you know the um the uh the territorial tax incentives did offer an avenue to do that, but I started to enjoy quite a bit the, the sort of planning aspect of it. And then Puerto Rico um, started a similar tax incentive program to the Virgin Islands. The mechanics are, are, are different, but the end result's the same, the 90% tax rate, mm -hmm. or in Puerto Rico, actually, 100% for, for capital gains. And, uh, and that's really how I got in, involved with crypto, because a lot of people mm -hmm. started coming to Puerto Rico Although I'll tell you, the, um, the 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 people who really got me into crypto, who I, who I, I still work with today, you know, you, you know, I still still good friends with them, um, were actually uh, in ad tech, right? And and I think that like that industry was really predisposed to understanding crypto and the value prop of crypto because mm. they already had these businesses where they were kind of denominating their bottom line. In like clicks and 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 fit, you know Facebook views and and these sort of intangible computer actions that can be translated into money. And so when you you know it's not that big a step for that person to say, okay, yeah, Ethereum, right? It's you know it's a smart contract. It's it's just automated. It's distributed ledger. You know these things are now automated on chain. And so. Um, that was kind of how I got I got involved with it, you know, probably I forget exactly when sometime in 2016, I started to hear more and more about it, get get involved with uh, with various clients. And then, you know, there's a real breaking a divergence in uh, in the territories where, um, you know, and I remember having these conversations with the government of the Virgin Islands saying, hey, look, the way that crypto works 
is so well suited to these territorial tax incentives because you don't need to be anywhere, right? If so, so if the rule for the U.S. government is like you have to live in the U.S. Virgin Islands to take this tax credit, that's fine for somebody who's involved with with crypto or digital assets generally. Like they can move there, and um, the government of the Virgin Islands just did not understand the the, the value proposition of crypto. Mm-hmm. Kind of shut the door, and everybody said, okay. We'll go to Puerto Rico, and then that's really when things kind of blew up with with the tax incentive program in Puerto Rico. And, you know, I keep hearing these whispers for years about, oh, the IRS is going to, like, drop the hammer in Puerto Rico, da, 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 da. I mean, they did, you know, they they have, I think, been scrutinizing the the tax incentive program a little bit more. They um, uh, indicted a a pretty high-profile accountant in, uh, in Puerto Rico and... And that was a couple of years ago. That case is still going on. So, you know, I think, I think they are looking into it. But the reality is, is that um, Puerto Rico is kind of, I don't want to say the center of the world, but a definitely a center of the world for crypto. I mean, I mean, you go, there's a, uh, I hope there's a, uh, uh, a Ritz Carlton resort called Dorado that's located uh, out yeah, in San Juan. I heard of that. And it's like. I- it's like crypto central if you go hang out in Dorado, like like you know, because it's all the guys who the whales who really made it, you know, and mm-hmm. because I think the houses in there are like, you know, five million plus or whatever to 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 get property there, but it, it's really nice, you know, the beach is beautiful, the the restaurants are good, da 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 da, and like it's some of the best networking I've ever I've ever seen in crypto, just because like you go like. Um, sit down in like the restaurant or whatever. And like, oh, there's Brock Pierce, you know, just like sitting at the table right next to you. And so it was, um, so then um, in 2018, I actually kind of took a step back from crypto because I I got a a position as general counsel for a a hedge fund that uh, trades natural gas futures called Skylar Capital. And uh, great, great people, awesome fund. I mean, they really kill it uh, in, in the net gas world. Uh, And so then, you know, I rolled out of that position um, beginning of like 2021-ish, sort of like slow, slowly turning over to the next person. And I, you know, that was a a fund that that faced the CFTC. And so the the, the CFTC, you know, I then brought that sort of regulatory experience along with my tax experience to crypto. And it was a, um, uh, just a real natural fit. Right. Yeah, I actually, I actually wanted to ask a bit more about PR because um, I remember I was, I was kind of looking into it. And then um, what was the, I guess, the, the the inflection point where just a ton of people just started coming into PR in drove, like, like, like crypto people specifically? Did you notice it like after 2017, 2018? Or? Yeah, it was it was it was probably in 2017 is when and, they, and the government actually. Um, uh, did a uh, uh, a real push in Puerto Rico to specifically attract the crypto crypto people in the crypto industry to, to Puerto Rico. And when they designed the law back in 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 twenty eight in twenty thirteen or twenty twelve is when they designed the law. I mean, Bitcoin was in existence, but they had no idea. They just kind of happened to design a a, a law that was uh, uh, very well suited to. Uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, crypto because because of the way they basically because of how capital gains are sourced um, they're sourced to the residents of the seller that uh, crypto you know for people right. who are trading in crypto the the zero percent capital gains in Puerto Rico was just like very very attractive and around 2017 right. they really kind of put two and two together and started doing these um, uh, uh, like conferences and stuff where they said, this is going to be the hub for crypto. And they really just leaned into it, you know? They're really intentional with it. Very much so, yeah. Right. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was frustrating for me to watch from the Virgin Islands. Oh, you're I like, why like, you guys doing this? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I felt like I had come to the VI government and yeah. said, hey, this, because we got the same, same rules. You know, I said, look, this could really yeah. work, you know? And they were just like, nope, yeah. not for us. And then you yeah, see, so, see it blow yeah. up in Puerto Rico and it's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> it's so interesting because these territories are like in this legal limbo state of like, they're mm-hmm. not exactly a state, but they're not exactly independent. Then the middle somewhere and like, because it's in like the middle, it's this kind of like 
they ha- kind of have this freedom, but also they kind of have like they don't have like the same kind of pr- right. protections and you know. Yeah, it's it is an interesting things. legal status, and it, and it does sort of allow for these tax incentives, but it's all backstopped by the U.S. Right? I mean, you're still mm-hmm. in the United States. Yeah. You're in the U.S. via yeah. Puerto Rico. Uh, politically, not culturally. Culturally, I think it's quite different. Um, yeah, yeah. But oh but, yeah. But, but like with uh, you know with, with these tax incentive programs, it's like the government, the federal government allows it to happen. If the federal government, on a concerted right. basis, mm-hmm. said we don't want these to exist anymore, they wouldn't exist. But mm-hmm. um, it's there's sort of shades of gray within that because some parts of the government like it, some don't. You know, so Congress mm-hmm. says, yeah, you can move to the VI and take these tax incentives. But then the IRS says, yeah, but did you really move to the VI, you know, and and, and it's uh, and so it's an interesting it's an interesting intersection um, um, politically yeah. because uh, uh, th- there's just a lot of different um, forces. Yeah. Work, and, and they're quite poor territory. So, yeah, they kind of like need a lot of help from the federal government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I actually want to get into more that you said a tug of war between a within the federal government. Uh, I want to get into that more. So within the federal government, um, which parts of it like crypto and are pro crypto and which parts of it are like necessary are not pro crypto or anti crypto per se. And this could be like agencies, this could be like congressmen or congresswomen, or this could be parties, this could be like, and let you know, legislative branch, executive branch, judicial branch, like which parts of the government are pro-crypto, which parts are anti-crypto that you've noticed? Yeah, it's a really great question, right? Because it's one of the issues that I don't think like maps very neatly onto the left-right divide that exists mm-hmm. in, in, mm-hmm. in the country generally, right? And so, you know, if, if you have, um, I, I, you can look at, I would say that from on a political party spectrum, in general, the Congress people who are have the most sensible ideas about crypto are Republicans, like Representative Emmer from from uh, Minnesota is, I think, the, the big one, uh, McHenry as well. You know, these are both pretty much, if you look at their their platforms, they're basically stock standard Republican Congress people. Um, but they, but, you know, they, they have taken a special interest in crypto. And I think for each of them, the big thing that they've done that I think is impressive is they've really gone out of their way to get people who understand the technology on their staffs so that they can come up with regulatory schemes that actually make sense given the, given the technology. Because the part of the problem you run into with Congress is that they come up with these laws that are intended to govern crypto, but they don't really understand what they're, what they're trying to govern. So, so it ends up being a little bit, you know, um, uh, non nonsensical, but I, I would say that most, of the executive agencies in 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 the U.S. right now are are fairly anti crypto. Unfortunately, I, I just think that's the environment that we have, where you 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 know, you have some people sort of pockets within both the CFTC and the SEC of people saying, hey, um, you know, let's figure out a way to like actually create rules um, for for these companies. But for the most part, um, I, I think that the idea in executive agencies, and this is true all the way up to the more or less the entire Treasury Department, is we don't we don't we kind of want this to just go away. It's sort of a pain in the butt, and like we we would rather like not have to deal with this. And so, um, you know, you you end up in a in a in a situation where uh, you want Congress right to step in. And say, okay, here are laws, right? Because you, you know, and and you really need it in a certain sense with crypto because so much of the technology is new and without direct historical analogy that you really want to have. You don't want to have executive agencies going out and making regulations, or as we've seen more of, just doing enforcement actions without there mm-hmm. ever having been sort of clear, like this is what the uh, the, the the guidelines actually are, and that ought to come from Congress, but Congress is not in a position right now. I just don't think that's going to happen over the next two years. I, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're not going to see very much, if any, major legislation in the next two years because we have the divided Congress. And, and unfortunately, I think that if you look at individuals, um, 
there are some individuals in Congress that crypto uh, legislation is important for, but it's not enough that it's going to be, uh, you know, nobody's going to spend any political capital on it, you know, in mm -hmm. serious fashion. And so I think that we're going to be left with, uh, with the various, um, you know, sort of alphabet soup agencies, which for the most part with crypto. Still, what's that? Still, it's been so long. Still, we've been dealing I, with the alphabets, waiting for legislating, waiting for something, something. Yeah, I know. And, I know. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's frustrating. And, and I mean, you know, especially with like, I, I mean, with taxes, you know, you, the, the most comprehensive guidance the IRS put out for crypto was a notice in 2014. Like, give me a break. Like that's, it's irrelevant now that the, the technology mm -hmm. moves so fast and, and yeah. uh, um, you know, I, it's, it's unfortunate. What yeah, will it take I, for, I, I was going to follow up. So is you said like, you know, no one's going to risk the political capital. So like, what will it take for Congress people to actually risk the political capital? It's going to take more lobbying efforts, you know, people showing up to Congress more. I mean, money talks and, you know, and just staying in DC talks. And I feel like, uh, you know, blockchain association and, and coin center have been like making their rounds and I'm just hoping that like ramps up. So like, yeah. what would it take? I, I, mean, I, I think that they're yeah. on the right track because, because it, it, look, things move very slowly in Washington and, and yeah, it is, um, it is going to take a concerted and, and directed lobbying effort. And I mean, lobbying is, I think maligned for good reasons, right? Because it, it kind of has come to symbolize the influence of money over politics, but like, People forget that lobbying is actually listed in the First Amendment as a protected right, you know, the right to petition Congress, right? I mean, that's what mm -hmm. lobbying is. And, and so, you know, it's, it's – um, I do think that – I'm not going to sit here and say I agree with everything the Blockchain Association does. And mm -hmm. um, I think that it was a big black – I don't want to spend too much time on SBF and FTX, but in the context of this discussion, I do think it was a big step back, not – necessarily everything that he did that was a big step back but the coziness of our lobbying groups even though the ftx wasn't technically a member of the blockchain association da, 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 I, I do think that that coziness he made a lot of he made a lot of congress people look really stupid basically mm, and and that yeah. um and that's going to make them reticent to to deal with people in the industry going forward and and that's yeah. um I think quite unfortunate because like I was saying before about how, you know, Congress people don't really have the technical knowledge to craft the legislation that we need to have crafted. That's actually true in a lot of different areas. And that is something that lobbying groups do that's productive, right? Is they have that store of knowledge that Congress people can tap into. And, and, and you know, in that sense, the Blockchain Association does a fantastic job. Because because the people who work for them do I think understand the industry, un understand you know what what we need. But uh, you know I think that I mean the other thing that I think will make things move a little bit more quickly or make them move at all really is is the large as larger institutions get involved with the space that is you know they already have plugs in, in Washington to sort of force things along, and and so yeah. it's it you know I think that. You know, I mean, and actually at Umami, I mean, that's one of our big focuses is like the institutional adoption of DeFi, right? I mean, that's kind of mm -hmm. has has to happen. And, and I think that the larger financial players, some of them are on the sidelines because of the lack of regulatory clarity. They, and, they, and, you know, but as that shifts, I think they can use their weight in Washington to get to get laws passed, which is not how you want to think of our legislative process working, but it is how it works. Right. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny because it's like a catch-22, right? It's like you want the large institution to come in, but they need regulatory clarity. But they're also the ones who could bring regulatory clarity. Yeah, so we're, we're, yeah. We're it, it's, it's a weird the, the institutions are coming to bring regulatory clarity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never would believe that crypto would ask for that. But yeah, maybe we kind of do need to ask for it right now. And I just wanted to make a quick note about like the whole uh, uh, Congress and, and left and right. Like, Crypto obviously doesn't fall clearly on the left or the right, but it also is not high enough on anybody's priority list that it's more like a footnote. So yeah. that it just kind of just yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, it, it, that's uh... what, 
Yeah, that's one thing I noticed when I was I was in DC in June for a conference. It was, I think it was like Crypto DC, and I met like a bunch of aides and some congressmen, and you know, it was a mix of like builders and people in DC. And like you, I mean, you can tell they were like interested, especially the aides, and they were curious about it. But they have so many other things on their agenda. Like crypto doesn't really lie high in that priority list. Like for many of these constituents of these districts, you know, they view crypto as like some exotic, boring thing. Like it's not, it's not really like on, it's not really in voters' heads, and therefore it's not in Congress people's heads. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 they don't. Um, and, and unfortunately for us, the way that it ends up getting on people's radar broadly is when something bad happens. Right. Like when yeah. you have a scandal, that's that's, you know, and, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Right. I don't know how I think it's a human issue. Like people just love train wrecks. And yeah. Stuff. I mean, I guess yeah. that's what it is. But, you know, I mean, I think from our perspective as people inside the industry, we see all this innovation and it's like, oh, man, like that's the story. That's what's important mm -hmm. is like all of this sort of flattening of, of financial transactions, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. it really is the future. And, and, you know, but you're right. I mean, it, you know, that's not, that's not the Washington post, or New York times or whatever. That's not a headline for them. The headline is yeah. such exchange collapses, you know, you guys want to know a fun fact about my past. I think you, you might know this, but I worked in Congress. I was a Hilton one summer. Oh yeah. So like, yeah. Once I, I was working on the Hill I was in, I was, you know, taking calls. I was, you know, going to hearings and stuff. So I, I have a taste of what it's like to be in Congress. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. I've kind of like, <laughs> I took the complete opposite path of that, okay. but it's a different world yep. being in DC. It, oh, yeah. Honestly, I didn't. Yeah. It's a whole, like, it's, it, I don't think there's like a world that's more 180 than crypto than DC. It's, you know, crypto is like breaking new ground, like meritocracy, this, you know, but like DC is like tradition institutionalized. It moves prestige. slow, prestige, <laughs> politics, the politics of politics to the extreme. And so when you have it, how, how do you like align those like two to like get them to be harmonious? Like how, what happened in the nineties? How did the internet like work out? Like how did like the US get it right on reg like regulation for internet in the nineties for then like the Facebooks and the Googles and Amazons to come out? I, I, so so my opinion about that is, 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 is that the, it was kind of a coincidence of timing, right? That you had, mm -hmm. you know, very much pro pro deregulation was like a, the big narrative in, in the nineties with Clinton and, and, you know, little government. That was when you kind of had, because the Democrats had taken such a beating for the last 12 years. They were like, maybe we need to get on the team of, of, of deregulation because it seems to be, have, you know, pull. And that's when you saw the technology emerging and, and, and there was already this attitude from the government of like, well, we should keep our hands off of it. And, you know, I mean, because like a lot of the technology that, that, that we think of as the Internet was in its nascent stages actually developed by the U.S. government, if not directly through DARPA, right, grants, right. you know, and, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. when it started to grow, I think they just said, OK, well, we'll see what happens. But like. You know, and I think this is kind of an analogy, analogous time to what's happening now. There was a lot of people in the dot com bust who were saying, "Well, it's over. That was a scam. It's so over." Yeah, pets dot com. What the hell, you know? And and then you know, and and, and it's true. Like ninety percent of those companies, they don't exist anymore. But the fact that we have Amazon, right, kind of indicates that yeah. they, obviously they had the right idea. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, Alex, I want to double click on that. Is that there was a sense of a deregulation back then, and the government just kind of sat on hands. And what's the difference between that and what the government is doing now, when they're kind of also sitting on hands, and sometimes the hands come out and just slap you across the face out of nowhere, but then they sit on the hands again. Like, what's, yeah. what's the difference? So, so I think that it's it's um, a lot of it. A lot of the change that were feeling a lot of the, the the change that is kind of causing the the negative impacts from the government and crypto right now i think are kind of tied into the 2008 financial crash in in in, in a certain sense because you know you had this real deregulation push in the 90s right and it led to all of these derivatives becoming unregulated right and the ultimate culmination of that was 
the the housing crisis where you had the, these you know mortgage backed securities that ended up you know you know being worthless it was this giant bubble that really impacted a lot of people's lives and um and the reaction to that you know with Dodd Frank in the bailout and everything was we need to swing the pendulum back the other direction and and we mm-hmm. need to put the CFTC and the SEC mm-hmm. kind of as a, as as a more of an active guardian of the market to make sure that these complex financial instruments are um, are actively regulated and oh, okay. and so because of that right like we have all of this power that the CFTC and the SEC mm-hmm. has and it's now kind of being wielded against crypto because like we're a target you know we're and we're actually a pretty right. bad target for um, for regulators because a lot of actors in the space. Are like not well well organized. They're not well capitalized. Like they have a hard time defending themselves, as you know, is evidenced by the Uki situation. And right. and uh, and so and so you know, I think that it's it's it was never intended, right? It was never obviously when they passed Dodd Frank, there wasn't like a big discussion of like, well, okay, we have to regulate digital assets. You know, they didn't care. That wasn't a thing that existed in 2010. Uh, but I do think that that is the the sort of beefing up of those administrative agencies they need something to do and crypto they need something to do yeah it's, it's yeah. interesting i didn't even think of it as in the 90s there's you know mm-hmm. a tendency towards deregulation and because you know the reagan republicans and that became popular in the 80s and like you said they took such a beating uh, the clinton administration continued that and even into the was it the steagall act or like the breaking of the glass steagall yeah. yeah stuff like that and then like actions like that led to 2008 and like literally pendulum really just swing. swing and then crypt yeah like you said it's all a matter of timing and then it was like oh shit we need to have more regulation again we need to like empower agencies to protect investors and now crypto came up in this position of protecting investors in the shadow of 2008 and now we have to deal with all this shit again um, but from yeah, instead of yeah. yeah, instead of them being like friendly towards innovation, they're actually very hostile towards innovation. Yeah, you kind of, and we kind of see the effects of, of that. Um, you know, a lot of innovation happening offshore. You know, a lot of stuff happening offshore. Um, do you see that trend continuing? Like, do you see like DeFi innovation coming going out of the U.S. more and more? I, I think so. I, I think that in the short run, especially, I think that it's. Um, I mean, I mean, because you have to look at uh, look at the incentives, right? I mean, that's one of the things I love about DeFi, like comparing DeFi to like our legal system, right? Is our legal system is based on you know rights and responsibilities. DeFi is based on incentives and disincentives, right? And 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 our and the regulatory scheme in the U.S. has incentivized people to to go offshore. There's there's no way around it, and and I think that again, kind of tying back also to like my comments about why the Puerto Rico tax incentive program is was so attractive to people in crypto because like there is this real attitude of like the world is flat, we can be where we want, and and we're gonna go to the places that are friendliest to the innovation that we're trying to do. And I think that, you know, you see a lot of in DeFi right now, you know, there's, there's these very popular sort of Cayman foundation. I mean, kind of what we're doing at Umami, right? Where we have a a Cayman Islands foundation that houses the Dow and then a U.S. services company that uh, does the development and technical services on behalf of the Dow. It's, it's, you know, we did not, I didn't invent that, you know, it, it, it's sort of tried and true. I think the Haymans is really leaning into it. You know, they, they love it. Um, and, you know, you see the same thing, I think, with Switzerland, right? Switzerland is very much leaning into, we want to be able to create entity structures that more accurately reflect the, the underlying organization of these companies, of a DAO, right? And so, you know, I mean, like one of the phrases that just – really grinds my gears whenever I hear it, right, is is legal wrapper. But you hear it all the time, right? Our DAO mm-hmm. has a legal wrapper. It's like yeah, that is yeah. that that's not what you want your your, your corporate entity to be. It, it needs to be integrated, right? But the problem is the way that DAOs are structured, right? Where DAOs are really structured to be this bottom up type of organization, we don't have corporate forms like entity forms 
that actually reflect that. And I think these foundations, right, are the most accurate um, reflection of, of like what the DAOs are trying to do. So like just a little bit of background on how they work. Um, you know, in the US, you have this concept of like a nonprofit, right? Where it's a corporation, it acts as a business um, for a charitable purpose, but it still acts as a business, but it doesn't have shareholders. There's no ultimate beneficial owner that can extract value from, from, from the function of the business. So all the Cayman Foundation is, is that form of a business entity, but without the requirement that it have a charitable purpose, that it can be organized for any sort of profit seeking uh, motive. But the point is the profits themselves don't accrete outside of the organization, which makes it a very natural fit for organizations that are organized around tokens, right? And want to incentivize token ownership because mm -hmm. using that corporate form, you can really, um, in, in a legal sense, give value to, to, to the tokens that people have that are representative of their interest in the DAO. And, yeah, and, and right. you know, and like you have like the Wyoming DAO. Yeah, LLC the Wyoming DAO. DAO. Yeah. I mean, but it's all pretty hokey. You know, I don't, I'm not like a big proponent of it. I think that. I, I, you know, it, it, the, the, the problem that you run into is, is, is like, okay, you have an operating agreement that references a smart contract, right? But it doesn't fix the fact that somebody has to own the LLC, right? And whoever mm -hmm. the owner of the LLC is, is ultimately permitted to extract value from that LLC, regardless of, of what the, um, the underlying tokenomics are, right? So it just... Mm -hmm. It's good. I'm glad they tried it in Wyoming. Like I'm not, I'm not knocking them for trying. I just don't think that it was ultimately successful in in yeah. creating the correct type of entity. Switzerland sounds like a dream when it comes to like the ideal world of regulation. Like I heard in Zug, you can just go to the bar down the street and boom, your financial regulator is there. You can go have a beer with them, talk about what's going on. It, yeah, and you can have a yeah. It's it's a whole different world, you know, and they're much more open and receptive to it. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is really night and day. And, and you know, um, um, speaking with Swiss attorneys, it's uh, I get jealous because <laughs> it's like it's I'm not saying legal work's never easy, but but it's it's a lot easier when 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 the regulators willing to have a conversation with you, you know, and that's yeah, I, that really is the case in Switzerland. And they want to, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, because I think historically Switzerland is a country that values privacy and financial privacy. I mean, the whole Swiss bank account thing ended up being kind of a scam, but like it- A honeypot. Yeah, it's really <laughs> a honeypot. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, um, but they, uh, but but I think that it does reflect the, the values in that government of, of like wanting to have um, fi financial privacy, you know? Yeah. And we, I before this interview, like going back to like definitions of like, U.S. law and like what actually happens in crypto. You wrote an article recently, you know, about is there such a thing alone in DeFi or is it all just code? Um, you know, it, because the way can you go into that article a bit more? Yeah, and, like, yeah. Summarize it because it's actually like because if it's not alone, technically, like does it fall under the regulation of being alone? That's right. No, it's fascinating. And so it really kind of ties into the my earlier comments about like the legal system being defined in terms of rights and responsibilities and DeFi being defined in terms of incentives, right? So what mm -hmm. in the law, right? What makes a loan? A loan is based on a promise. If you, what makes a loan different from a gift, right? If you, if you give me a hundred dollars right now and I wander off with it, then, and then that's just a gift, right? But what makes it a loan is I have promised to pay it back to you. And then you kind of get into issues of, of collateral, right? And collateral in, in, in law is still attached to this idea of a promise. So if, if you give me a hundred dollars and I like give you my cell phone or whatever, say, hold this while I do my thing with your hundred dollars, then like what makes me handing my cell phone to you collateral is the fact that it's attached to this underlying loan, which is defined by my, my promise to pay, right? And what I really wanted to do in that article mm -hmm. is illustrate that this definition, this, this is not a new concept in law, right? That it, the earliest common law about debt is based on this idea of a promise, 
Okay, but then you look at DeFi, you look at like Aave or whatever. There's no such thing as a promise on chain, right? Mm -hmm. It like mm -hmm. the, either like if something is if I want to say something is going to happen on chain, I put it in a smart contract that it's going to happen, right? That's how you know it's going to happen. It, the promise has nothing to do with it, and so if I go, you know, put a bunch of ETH into Aave and then take uh, USDC against my ETH, right? I've not promised Ave that I'm going to pay the USDC back. You know, I don't like there's, I mean, I couldn't, right. It's not a person. It's, it's a completely autonomous piece of software. There'd be nobody for mm -hmm. me to promise. I just have assume I either I have an incentive or a disincentive to pay that USDC back. And, you know, it, let's say the price of ETH tanks. Well, my incentive to, to pay that USDC back is, is now gone. I'm liquidated, but whatever. Right. Um, uh, there was not, but I didn't break a promise to Ave when I did that. Mm -hmm. I just the incentives changed, and so you know I don't know that you, you know you see all these protocols that call themselves lending protocols, and I think that I don't disagree with that. Yeah, because like people understand what it means, right? Like if if, if I called Ave an options protocol, I don't think people would get it. Right. So I call it a lending protocol, but really you're get, it, really, it's an option, you know? And, and so, um, you know, because I don't quite literally have the option to pay it back. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Quite literally an option. And, and so, yeah. you know, I think that it's never been tested. Right. And I'm really curious the first time we have, I think it's going to come from a state regulator, probably New York, possibly California, um, saying, Hey, you're you're actually like writing consumer loans, and therefore all of our consumer lending laws have to apply to you. And uh, uh, which would be kind of funny if that happens, right? Because like they've they've gone to the, all these great lengths to like carve banks out of or like payday lenders out of like the lending laws. But I could totally see a scenario where they're like, well, we're gonna try to enforce this on chain anyway. And I, and I do think that that there will be an argument. Um, in court, I don't know when, but I, but I, I think it's going to happen about whether you can actually have a loan on chain. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge ramifications because if it goes right, then you know it will create like a new like rush, gold rush of like lending protocols, and institutions will be a lot more likely to use them. Yeah. Um, but if it goes wrong, then it's like a big it's over scenario for US DeFi because lending is such a big part of DeFi. It's oh. literally like the third part of the DeFi trinity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then you know, like, I mean, I mean, of course, you know, given the products that we develop at Umami, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about GMX and GLP and, and you know, mm -hmm. how those assets work. And it's like, you know, I look at something like GLP and, and like it trying to describe like what GLP is using the terms of like US financial regulation is quite difficult, right? Is it a loan? Is it a repo? Is it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, 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 it's really, it's, it's another one of those things that's sort of like without, without analogy. Yeah. And, and so you end up, um, I mean, I think there's a tendency, which I myself am guilty of sometimes, I think everybody is of being like, well, this is unclear. So like, let's interpret it in a way that's the most beneficial to us, you know? But yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say it's an index, right? Yeah, like index, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Because it really is just representative of this like constantly morphing underlying basket of tokens, you know? And, and so mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, uh, but, but like when I have a GLP token, like what do I have is like, <laughs> it's a simple question, but it's actually like quite complex, you know. Yeah, where does this real yield come from? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an index oh. rebalanced by bad traders. Yes. For me. Yeah. <laughs> I always like. I always thought like GMX has like the best product market fit for crypto because like crypto is still like you know if you still think of it as like right now in this moment like if it's still like the casino like GMX has like positioned itself as like like the best arena for traders on chain. Oh yeah. And so yeah. like, it's like the perfect product market fit. And you know, it, you can see it in the fees. So you can see it in millions of dollars of fees every day, but also at the same time, like they're kind of, I feel like GMX is limited in how much they can grow at the moment. Like then the product market fit right now, but I feel like for them to evolve and I'm sure they know this too, they're going to have to 
make some changes to their model. But it was a great bootstrap, honestly. Uh, yeah. You had to give it to them. You really oh, do. Absolutely. And and I think that it, it also like something like GMX, and this kind of comes up with the with the Uki case as well, really mm -hmm. presents this novel question with respect to um CFTC regulation specifically, which is that mm -hmm. you know what the CFTC alleged about Uki is that there are a unregistered um FCM, which means that they're charging a commission for uh, for a futures market, which on the one hand, um, th that's like pretty compelling. But on the other hand, you don't really have in traditional finance, this idea of like distributed market making, like like GLP doesn't really exist in, in, in traditional finance, because in traditional finance, you have like, if you have a derivatives market, there will be like a centralized market maker who's kind of the counterparty mm -hmm. For the for the bets that, that 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 everybody else is making, and then you know from the CFTC's perspective, it's very clear that's the person you need to regulate, right? Because they are the market. Um, mm -hmm. But in DeFi, both sides are distributed, right? You have traders on one side who are are making their I mean I don't want to call them bets, they're basically bets, right? On you know which way the token is going to go, and they want to use leverage on on those bets, da 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 da. But that leverage is also coming on the other side from this disparate group of people who don't know each other and they don't know the people on the other side of the trade. And there's not an analogy to that in, in the traditional financial markets. Yeah, like here's the this is what, like here's the thing. Like we're still this is why we're still in like the quote unquote gray area, because this hasn't been defined. Like smart contracts haven't been defined under law. Like, I mean, we're still, I mean, if you look at like the securities case with the oranges, like all those years ago. Like we're still like basing DeFi off of that. And it's just insane to me that I forget the name of that case Howie. that we still, the uh, Howie, how, of course, the Howie case. Yeah. Yes. The Howie test. How could I forget? We're still basing DeFi off of that. And that the Howie test itself is a subjective test. It's hard, you know, even in not in DeFi in like traditional securities, like it's subjective as well. And then applying that to DeFi is a whole other thing. And you know what's an interesting thing about the Howie case that I think gets lost in a lot of the conversation, you know, around mm -hmm. crypto and DeFi specifically, is that Howie is a case about investment contracts, right? And mm. the the issue in Howie is were these contracts that uh, offered an interest in orange groves in Florida investment contracts that are securities, right? And 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 that's what that case deals with, but nowhere in Howie did anybody ever suggest that your orange is a security, right? The orange is just like, that's what's growing. That's what gets sold. And so people talk about, is this token a security under Howie? Well, Howie's not going to answer the question of whether a token like your property is, is security. Mm -hmm. Howie only answers the question of how you got that token, right? Was the contract mm. under which you received that token as a security? And I think it's the process. It's the process. Yeah, yeah. And and I and it, I really think that that you 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 people use this shorthand and then justifiably, you know, people use this shorthand of being like, is this token a security? And it's like, no, it's number. No, it's just it's just you know, it's just it's just numbers on your computer. That mm -hmm. can't be the security. The security has to be the transaction that surrounds it. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, because like everything surrounding like how you got that token, like, you know, you know, how you received it, like how it was sold, like how if it was quote unquote marketed, this and that, like all those things come into, uh, you know, that all those things are judged whether it is a security or not. Well, I never really thought of it as a process. Yeah, that makes a lot, and, and because it's a lot easier to think of it. As it is. Process. It is actually yeah. like like because trying to figure out like is this token, which is just sort of this static thing, right? Is that a it, you know? I mean, and, and I think some tokens, because of the smart contracts, right? Some tokens do in fact represent a process, but those are really few and far between, right? Like most most tokens that are like the quote unquote digital store of value, you know, which you see in definitions everywhere they're inert they don't they don't do anything yeah right yeah i'm i'm still thinking about that like where where do, do you see like a world where like the if 
do you see a world where with digital tokens like it sorry i'm just like lost my thought here <laughs> kit what are you thinking yeah. right now I, I'm thinking like we're, we're going pretty ham on DeFi, but then obviously there's this other leg of crypto of like all the NFT stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would love to maybe, you know, get a <laughs> refresh in the air and, you know, kind of change the atmosphere in the room a little bit and get Alex's thought on like NFTs and how like regulation path looks differently than that of DeFi. Well, it's, it's just maybe art. the same. <laughs> it's just, it's literally just art, so... Yeah, right. I, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, NFTs are are, um, are are interesting, right? Because, again, it does kind of tie into this, like, well, what's the process, right? And, like, yeah. I think you have yeah. this big narrative in NFTs, which is, like, utility. And it's like, well, utility for what, right? If you're telling me mm-hmm. I'm going to, like, buy this NFT and then you're going to go off and do something and then I'm going to make money off the NFT – that does kind of feel like an investment contract, right? You know, yes. and, but like if I'm buying the NFT, cause I, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not an NFT guy. Like, I, I mean, I like NFTs conceptually, right. And I buy them. Just don't buy the ones I buy. Cause I've never bought one that actually like turned into anything. <laughs> but I buy, You're in it for the art. I, I actually <laughs> am in it for the art. And like, <laughs> so am I. It actually is. <laughs> and, and like this, hopefully I don't, I don't piss anybody off by saying this, but actually like my favorite NFTs are the the writer rips board apes, right? Not because I mean he's kind of a jackass, right? But like the um I mean that's his persona. I'm sure in person he's like quite nice. Um but like the idea what he I think the idea he's really trying to convey is like all your NFT is is a token address, right? So like like that's why I love the phrase like you can't copy an NFT. Like you can't like, like my, the, 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 the token ad, you can copy the art, but the actual token address is completely unique. Mm-hmm. It is in fact, non-fungible and like that cannot be copied. So like, I mean, he's going to lose that litigation. You know? I think he's going to get absolute steamroll, but mm-hmm. it's, 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 uh, uh, it, I think he, the point he's making artistically is really critical, you know? And, and I, and I do, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I think that like, if you look at like the prehistory of NFTs, they kind of go back to um, Namecoin. I don't know if you yeah. guys are familiar with that, like the Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. there's a pretty compelling argument. I don't know if I buy the buy the whole thing that like Namecoin was like the original attempt to to create NFTs with their like distributed DNS system. That like if they're kind of like trying to create that same using a Bitcoin yeah. fork, obviously, right, so they don't right, have a smart right. contract. But like they're trying to create that same unique address that can reference a piece of artwork and therefore ownership. Yeah. I've heard the argument made to me that Dogecoin in a sense was the original NFT because it's just like, you know, this joke of a coin that has this community around it. It's a collect it's a it's an NFT in a sense that it's a collectible. It's like, oh like Dogecoin, like ha ha, like funny dog, this and that. But like at you know, it's kind but back then they didn't have NFTs, but now like you can have like, you know, your own ten thousand you know, profile picture collection out there. That's like kind of the same thing, you know, bringing communities together and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, I mean, and, and in that sense, um, the, I think there's more overlap between NFT NFTs and like the DeFi world than, than, than you know, often get there's credit for because, because of what you just pointed out, right. Because of the community aspect of each of them, right. You can almost like, I, I see a lot of people sort of judging DeFi protocols the same way they judge NFT groups. Like, how strong is the community? And, and yeah, uh, it, it, I'd say the two. Yeah, I'd say the two most important parts of a protocol are, you know, it's like I call it the body, which is like it's tokenomics, like how the token, like how the coin works, and you know how it's distributed, and this and that, and also the soul, which is the community. Like the community, the soul, like brings actual life. Like you can have the best tokenomics in the world, but if no community behind it, then what's the point? And you have this like great community, but your tokenomics are shit. Then you know it's you're in a much tougher position. So so there's this um, there's this legal scholar named uh, uh, she, she named Primavera de, Fil- de Filippi. I think she's Swiss or Italian. I, I forget. She she practices law in Europe. At this point, she's mostly a scholar, right? But she has this um, this theory that she calls institutional theory, right? Like instead of an institution, an institution, and it's so germane to the world of like crypto and DeFi and NFTs 
because it like you're describing this like dichotomy between like the sort of body and soul, right? And so, mm -hmm. for, you know, from my perspective as like an attorney thinking about institutions, thinking about corporations, that that type of form, I see the same interplay between the the Dow, right? The 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 like soul, the the people, the community behind it, and the entity on the other hand, right? Mm -hmm. like, like the foundation, corporation, uh -huh. whatever. And like, I find um, De Filippi's arguments about institutions very useful for describing this dichotomy, right? Where you have institutions that are this kind of like bottom up organic people relating to each other and like figuring out their own, their own sort of forms of social relationships, decision making, et cetera, that are, that are from the, the bottom up. And then you have institutions which are rigid and hierarchical and decisions are made from the top down. And so much of what's going on in uh, like DeFi and I think to a certain extent NFT legal work right now is navigating these two pieces. Like where do they meet? Mm -hmm. and how do you translate between the two of them? You know? This is the first time I've heard the word extrutation before. Yeah, same. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's like bottom up organization yeah right. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's just like a, it's coming coming from the outside yeah like, yeah right exactly yeah yeah it's an yeah. organization where the rules develop organically and are therefore in flux all the time based on the participants mm -hmm. versus versus and if new participants come in then the rules can shift because that that's what it's reflecting whereas mm -hmm. an institution is because of this hierarchy it doesn't the institution is agnostic as to the participants, right? It has its process, mm -hmm. and yeah. and it's, uh, I mean, it's it, the way the different ways that people are coming up with to sort of navigate this exchange yeah. of control and ideas is absolutely fascinating right now. I think it's something that people are going to look back on 20, 30 years yeah. from now and be like, wow, yeah. these are like new ideas, you know? I I've always, I kind of viewed with like DAOs and both like on chain, and then they have the legal they have to deal with as like the legal back end. Like, oh, they have to like all this stuff like happening in the, the body part is like the back end and the front end was shown on chain. is like the Dow and stuff. Is that the wrong way to look at it? Is that no, like I, I don't think that's the wrong way to look at it at all. Right. I think yeah. that it's like and I think like in that sense, the body mind dichotomy is like is like apt. Right. Because like yeah. as a human being occupying a body like you don't you cannot say where your mind ends and your body begins. Like if, I, if you yeah. like get a paper cutter, or whatever, you're like, ouch that hurt my body, right? But in terms yeah. of like, you know, what your brain is versus the rest of your body, you don't internally know that. And and I think that the way that DAOs function is like quite similar because, I mean, just thinking about Umami, right? You know, we have this really vibrant community of, of, of token holders who are very enthusiastic about what we're doing. And we mm -hmm. try to like incorporate their feedback. But on the other end of the spectrum, like my job, is to make sure that we can operate in the real world. And if we're dealing with another corporation, that they can speak corporation to corporation, you know, we can speak that language. And so it is, um, but that's why I, I don't like the legal wrapper terminology because I feel like it makes the the entities sound superficial when they're not. Yeah. The integral part of any business organization. It, it, and, and if yeah. you do it wrong, you have real problems. You hear the legal wrapper um mm -hmm. put forth a lot in real world assets like especially for example in real estate it's like oh we have like an LLC and then we like you know wrap it and it's into you know we we wrap it like we really we, oh we have this real estate we wrap it in LLC we put the LLC like as an NFT on chain and then we token it's so complicated there's so many different steps and especially with real estate which is highly regulated it doesn't seem like it's going to work yet no I don't think asset. it is and and I I mean, like, I know some of the folks involved with Roofstock, and I really do, like, admire what they're doing. But fundamentally, how that's organized, right, is, like, you have an LLC that owns a, owns a piece of property, right? Okay, that's not new. That's tried and true. And then when you buy and sell that piece of property on chain as the quote-unquote NFT, you're, the NFT is somewhat is, like, symbolic of the ownership of the LLC, right? So when you transfer the NFT, you're not transferring ownership of the LLC. But like it's not, right? It's just it's just it's kind of like a little game because if if I go <laughs> hack somebody's wallet, right, and steal their the the NFT that is their roofstock house, 
as the person who had their NFT stolen, I go back to Roofstock and say, hey, my NFT was stolen. I need you to mint me another one. And then they do it, right? Because what actually controls who owns the LLC that owns the house is the paperwork that's associated with, with the transaction. So yeah. you, you, you're sort of like putting this like, oh, that's neat. You're, you're, you're selling a house using an NFT, but really it's, it's like, that's not who owns the house. It's just like, if I sell a house with a bank transfer, the bank transfer doesn't own the house, right? I mean, it's the, the, the ownership of the LLC is reflected in paperwork somewhere. And that's what it is. And that's the way it's always going to be because, you know, historically, you had these things called bearer share corporations, right? And so a bearer share corporation, the share of the corporation represent, the physical share of the corporation represents the ownership of that corporation. So if I have the certificate in my possession that, that indicates the, 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 the shares in the corporation, I own that corporation. If I hand that, that certificate to you, you own the corporation now by virtue of that transfer. Um, these are incredibly disfavored in, in the modern legal system. I think you can still do bearer share corporations in the Seychelles, but like even that, I'm sure they're not really recognized anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And like, but that's what they want to have, right? With this whole Roofstock thing. They want to have, they want the NFT to be the bearer share of the LLC, but they mm -hmm. don't want that, right? Because they don't want the world where you are actually like self custodying the ownership of this house. And if you lose it, I mean, because imagine what that means, right? If you if you fuck up and and excuse me and and, and send that NFT to like the, the you burn the NFT, then what? Well, nobody owns the house now. I mean, yeah. I mean that's not gonna work. Get out the house. <laughs> yeah, you gotta move. Like a lot of, yeah. Another thing I wanted to get into is uh, you're seeing, you know, certain real world assets go on chain uh, that are that are not exact. They're ETFs. They're ETFs of bonds coming on chain. I think Ando had a product kit. You yeah. saw that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So like, what are your thoughts on, you know, bonds, ETFs and treasuries coming on chain? Be very careful. <laughs> that's, that's my thought, right? I be mean, very I mean, careful. Be very careful yeah. because I'll, I'll talk about the high level first and then I'll get into sort of like the details of, of, of how these work, but like at a high level, the idea that you're going to represent treasury yields on chain is very dangerous to the U.S. government. Like, like that is something that the SEC unambiguously does not want to have happen. Okay, because they can't control that, right? And and it's mm -hmm. it's like the base interest rate. And and like I think the the arbitrage that the narrative behind this arbitrage is very compelling because you have so much USDC liquidity, however you want to categorize it, on chain. You know, the 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 interest rates are now completely out of whack between the actual like rates that are applicable to like cash versus stable coins. And it's because of this barrier, right? Between the, the quote unquote real financial system and the on-chain um, financial mm -hmm. system. And like, I understand like the drive to, to like do this art, right? I mean, the trader in me, which is a terrible trader, licks my chops. The dog in you yeah. really wants this. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the dog in me recognizes the dog in you. Yes, yes, exactly. 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 And and so but the, but the problem I think that you have that you run into, and, and I don't know the folks involved with with, with Hondo at all, but mm -hmm. but I looked into what their structure is, right? And so um, and I hope this isn't like overly technical, but what they've done mm -hmm. is they've created what, what's called a 3C7 fund, which is which just refers to an exemption of a registration of a security, right? And so, oh, just to take a step back, when you think about these treasuries, right? The treasury securities. So if you go out and buy a bond or a T-bill, whatever, from the US government, you're buying a security. It's an unregistered security, right? Because what sense does it make to have the federal government register a security with the federal government? You know, So obviously for like, Practical reasons, they're exempt, but they're still securities. So if I take an, an abstraction, uh, any abstraction of a, of a government sec uh, security and sell that abstraction, by definition, I'm selling a security. It's not a close call, you know? Mm -hmm. And so anybody who's going to do an on-chain abstraction of a treasury security has to think about securities registration, right? They have to have a strategy. You can't do it without having figured that part out. And so what they've done with Ando 
is they have like this three C seven fund, mm. which means that your three C seven funds are only available to what's called qualified purchasers, which is somebody who's got basically $5 million or more in assets. And that, um, and the idea is we don't need these securities to be registered with the SEC because anybody who controls this kind of a assets are sophisticated enough to look out for themselves. That rule mm -hmm. makes a certain amount of sense, right? And so um, when you go and I, I think the token's called like OUSG or something like that. Um, when you go and like get, and I don't know if you can get them yet. I, I don't know if they're live yet, but when you go and exchange your USDC for OUSG, what you're actually doing is you're getting a, an, an interest in this fund um, that is represented by your OUSG token, right? And, and that fund is actually not, that fund doesn't even own treasuries directly. That fund actually owns the BlackRock ETF, short-term treasury, mm -hmm. short-term treasury ETF, which is fine. That, that makes more sense. I'm buying treasury mm -hmm. the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. is complicated. Um, so let BlackRock do it, you know? And so, yeah. but part of being a 3C7 fund is that you have to, um, you can't, you can't like just freely market your your interest in the fund, right? Because that's just an end run around the requirement that you're a qualified purchaser. So there are secondary markets for these fund interests, but they're heavily gate kept because you have to only have qualified purchasers mm -hmm. in, in the room. And so all of this part like makes sense to me, right? Like the, 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 the tokenizing of it, I think makes a certain amount of sense. The um, it's been done on chain before you know, there's a R coin, which is like a closed end fund that launched in 2020, doing something very similar. Um, and, and so th that part of the idea is not new. What's new is they're quote unquote, I don't even want to say it's quote unquote permissionless because they're not really saying it's permissionless, right? They've now created this other protocol called Flux, which I don't think is launched yet. And you can use your permissioned OUSG, right? Because the, o the OUSG has to be permissionless. You can't freely really transfer it, mm -hmm. but you can go. So they forked Compound right into into this Flux thing, and you can use your OUSG as collateral for a USDC loan, right? Just like you could on Compound, except because of this restriction on transfer of of the fund interest itself, mm -hmm. you cannot. Uh, liquidate that 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 uh, that loan as the lender in 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 this in this compound fork, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that would be again. I think they do like OFAC checks, but they're not making sure that it's a qualified purchaser. I don't believe on the other side of of, of these loans. And so, um, I am a little bit skeptical. I guess like I'm skeptical mm -hmm. of it because I don't know that their theory on you can use this interest in a fund as collateral is really going to hold up. I, it might, I'm, you know, it's not, I, I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, mm -hmm. but it seems like because you can't liquidate these loans on in flux, the risk, it, it kind of makes me sad, right? Because it, the risk is all being pushed on the USDC lenders, which are basically mm -hmm. retail, right? Because that's the, mm -hmm. that's, you why does this it, always happen? Yeah, why, yeah, exactly. Why does this always happen? We're supposed to protect retail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. I'm certainly going to be yeah. on the sidelines, and maybe I'm going to yeah. look like an idiot for, for being on the sidelines. It's happened to me before, but I, I am, I'm very interested in Ondo, but I'm also very skeptical. Yeah. Speaking of just regulation and stable, I want to turn towards stablecoin regulation in general. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Rooney Trust Act was introduced to Congress. I'm not sure if you had a look at that. Yeah. But I thought it put like some very friendly fiat uh, stablecoin regulation and actually provide a common sense framework for fiat stablecoins. And in the legislation itself, it has privacy protections, you know, exceptions from the Bank Secrecy Act. It had a path for fiat stablecoins to not be a bank. And have like an entity that can get a Fed master account, which is a big topic of discussion yeah. at Frax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I would love to get your thoughts on the Tommy Act. Yeah, well, I, mean, I mean, yeah, the Trust Act. First of all, uh, your article on it is fantastic. Like, oh, thank you. I read that, and, and honestly, it's um, I'm not just blowing smoke. I thought that was actually some of the most astute analysis of the legislation that I've seen. So, 
I, I assume that, that, that your listeners probably have a pretty good idea already of like, <laughs> like, like what, what it looks like. But yeah, I, I mean, I agree with, um, with, with, with your analysis. I mean, I think that the, what needs to happen for our industry is we need to divorce the interactions between the quote unquote real financial system and the on-chain financial system from speculation. This has held us back so much that like the on-ramps into crypto have been these centralized exchanges that mm -hmm. are just awful. Like some of them are more awful than, than others, but they all sort of share being awful, right? And what I like about the, 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 the trust act, right, is that by siloing um, stablecoin providers, right, into that being the only thing that you can do to get this license, like if you do anything else, you're not eligible for the license. Mm -hmm. You can just issue stable coins, redeem stable coins, and hold a very specific type of asset as reserve for the stable coin. And that's it. And I think that if that gets enacted, it will be quite helpful, right? Especially the part of it where mm -hmm. you can be a money services business, right? And, and obtain this license because, uh, or, or obtain the, the, these abilities as, as a stable coin provider. Be, and that is good because we need to be encouraging a system where the entities that can take money for services, right? And the service being giving mm -hmm. crypto. We need to put that in as small a box as possible. And I'm not saying, uh, obviously, we're in, the, we're in the world where everybody's got to make money, right? And so, you know, I want there to be a path forward for those companies to make money. I just don't want that path forward to be, I want that to be a fee-based path forward for the service they're providing, not mm. this ancillary, welcome to the casino, like, here are your chips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Have fun. <laughs> have fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so I, I do see it as a huge step forward in terms of our industry growing up. I really do. Yeah, it's and in terms of the Fed master account, I'm not sure if you've, you know, looked into Frax's proposed plans for that or you know, it's been I, it's that. not an area I'm familiar with. Uh, yeah, so Sam like his his whole thesis is like real world assets are, you know, too risky, too complicated. They're not worth pursuing and Frax itself like it's I call it the one commandment Frax is everything exists on chain. But the one real world asset that is worth pursuing is getting a Fed master account. And obviously like Frax can't deposit directly in the Fed master account. And so how it theoretically work is that there's this, I call it like this bridge entity or like whether it's like a bank or whether, you know, if this legislation gets enacted, it's this like other like, you know, regulated service that it that has, it, let's say they like this entity does get a Fed master account. It has, you know, puts dollars in the Fed and like earns interest. Then it issues Frax USD against it. And then at the and then it's the Frax USD that backs Frax, and like it's the Frax USD that is like regulated and has to comply with everything. But how I see it is like it will be rebasing, you know, and it's supply will be rebasing based off the interest rate, and that's what would be backing Frax in the end. Like, I mean, that isn't confirmed, but that's how I like envision and imagine it. It's like how like feasible is that? Well, so so I think that like you have to be under the framework that's in the Trust Act. You, you have to tread with a certain amount of caution, right? Because yeah. You, you know, if you, if there's anything which is sort of endemically interest bearing about the token oh, itself, true. Yeah, it can't be true. a stable coin under, under that legislation. So, and it is very, I mean, like, and I think that like circle, you know, with USDC has to, has to like deal with this a certain amount too. I mean, you know, I, I don't believe that USDC is a security or that, redeeming usdc for us dollars is a securities transaction yeah you're right but but like yeah. i think that is because there is a fixed price of the usdc right so mm -hmm. circle can and should hold a mix of of treasury assets right because like you know especially in the interest rate environment that we're in you really don't want entities holding reserves on a, on a zero interest basis, right? Then that's actually the reserves losing ground in the inflation mm -hmm. environment that we're mm -hmm. in. So you yeah. want those reserves to be earning interest, but you have to have it be interest is backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government. Otherwise it's not really a reserve. And so mm -hmm. I do think that from a stablecoin issuer perspective, you have to be very careful of like 
saying, we need this yield from the government to bolster our reserves, but we're not necessarily going to pass mm -hmm. that directly to the stable yes. coin holders because we need that to be a stable coin. Oh, I understand. So it can't be like set up like frac seed. It has to be like, there has to be like a strict line between, you know, the interest part and the stable coin part, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. I think that that's doable ultimately. You yeah. Know? That, like, yeah. Like, that is doable. Separate it out. Right. Yeah. Which and I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say I'm speculating. Like I'm just so like, yeah, I, nothing I say is like, but oh gonna, yeah, I have no yeah. line of insight into frats. Yeah. Obviously, I respect <laughs> the hell out of what they're doing, but like I don't yeah. know me, mm -hmm. I don't know them. I, I do, yeah. but I do think that like it would be awesome if they had it, right? Yeah, yeah, it would be it would be sick. Yeah. But um, Kit, Alex, what are you the, say? The, the moment, you, um, I wanted to ask like the moment say Frax tries to redistribute those interest profits, does it then become a security? Because well, it, it is now a process it, that it's... Yeah, it depends, it depends on, on to whom it, it, it um, distributes it. And in a certain sense, uh -huh. if, if they're doing it right, there's actually not going to be that much yield to distribute, right? Because the whole point of having... Like you need... If you're building a reserve, you need to have some assets that are just available on demand, right? Like the moment that it's mm -hmm. needed. You have to mm -hmm. be able to, to transfer, which is cash, which doesn't right. inherently okay. have, have any interest rate. But like the reason you want to have, you know, some of your reserves not in cash is because the cash you are holding is losing value, right? Even if you're mm -hmm. paid yep. one to one on the on the underlying asset, you want to have the yield kind of mm -hmm. inside yeah. of your of your reserves because it makes the reserve stronger. But like obviously banks right pay that yield out to somebody you know and it's like does it go to and so it goes to the shareholders of the banks in essence like or other sort of yeah. more, more complicated and exotic transactions so i think that and and i'm gonna really rapidly like run into the end of like what i know about frax and how it operates but i do mm -hmm. think that there would be a mechanism even under the trust act um as as it stands now to allocate um some some of those gains to other people who hold a token. I just don't know that it can be the stable coin token. And and so mm, it's an interesting problem to solve. I don't actually I, I don't actually I can't really speculate like right now as we're sitting here chatting like yeah right, right, how right, they right. solve it, but I think it's solvable. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Um Dave this what, is cool. What do you think yeah. It, yeah. I was gonna say I, wait, for the last uh, thirty minutes, maybe we'll we'll kind of switch gears, go to like the Uki Dao situation, and kind of get some yeah, key I have, takeaways I have from other. More, yeah, yeah, I have ahead. one more question. So, like, I saw a thread recently, um, and like something I've written about in the past, and I interviewed people about in the past, is like this split in DeFi that's eminent between regulated DeFi and permission DeFi and permissionless DeFi, RegFi, DarkFi. This and you know, it has a bunch of different names. Um, and I saw that recently that, you know, anything that's dollar denominated is going to be in this permissioned DeFi and everything that is, you know, permissionless DeFi, ETH is going to most likely end up being the stable coin for that. Yep. Um, and I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on, you know, that observation? Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a huge narrative in 2023 is this split, however you want to, however you want to refer to it. Um, but, but the, uh, you know, I, I think that it comes back to like this concept of a settlement layer for financial transactions, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole basis of the uh, Ethereum network, right, is that Ether is designed as the settlement layer, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but because we live in a dollar world, right, we don't live in an ETH world, we think of all of these transactions right. as dollar denominated transactions because I don't. I, I think of everything as dollar denominated. Like if I go to the store, the prices are in dollars. So I think about the world mm -hmm. in dollars, you know? And and so if if um you know, but the the actual function by design of Ethereum is what you're describing as the quote unquote like dark fi side, right? Where the settlement layer is Ethereum, and that's just it. That is the base currency, right? Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, that's how Ethereum works now. Right. It's just mm -hmm. USDC or USDT, whatever is like bootstrapped to all of these transactions. And like, and it's another area 
I'm just gonna like keep bagging on centralized exchanges. And I'm not gonna apologize for it. But it's but no. it's another area where we kind of got screwed over by the centralized exchanges, right? Because they really wanted to create these exchanges that use the dollar as the settlement layer. And that's mm -hmm. never how, how crypto was designed to function. It's never how Ethereum was designed to function. And 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 so, you know, I do think that like the like legal permission side of DeFi, it's probably gonna be the side that I'm on. You know, I'm the lawyer, right? That's that's where I'm gonna go. But the other side is gonna be the real side. Like I don't know, I don't know how else to put it. The other side is gonna be it function the, the system functioning as it was designed. Yeah, what does that mean for crypto cloud by stable coins? Like what does that mean for like DAI and what does that mean for um, Axe? Yeah. You know, it's uh I don't know. I don't know how that's gonna really unfold um for, for, for those protocols, right? Because I think that like the other real danger, right? And I, and I do think as a privacy minded individual, I do believe this is a real danger. Another thing I liked about the Trust Act is, is, is that like in this permissioned world of DeFi, there is this sort of natural space for a central bank digital currency, right? Uh, uh, like, and, and what, what, what I am really concerned about in this permissioned space as it, as it develops is, is that like we will not have it will be in no way, shape, or form censorship resistant, right? Because mm -hmm. like the the central bank digital currency is going to look a hell of a lot more like USDC than it does like Dai, right? Where mm -hmm. like you know if Circle does not want your wallet address to use USDC, you're not using USDC. It's that simple, and that's mm -hmm. what the government really wants um, for for the like dollar that exists on chain and. Um, and I think that's very dangerous, right? Because cash is important, right? And, and if we live in a world where the fact that you want financial privacy is indicative on whatever level that like you're committing a crime, criminal activity, da 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 da, da I think it's a huge problem, right? And, and, and I don't think that like, um, and, and I think that like, as we get into this permissioned world of DeFi, right? We actually, it's up to the people who are designing those systems to build privacy into it, you know, because- Yeah, it has to be banks into it, whether it's with ZKs or other things. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and it's a difficult problem because that's not, the government doesn't really love privacy, you know? As we see with Tornado Cash. As we see with Tornado Cash. I mean, I mean yes. that was such a debacle, you know? And, and it's, uh, um, and, but, it, but it's indicative of, 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 of OFAC's thinking for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kit, you want to get into uh, Uki? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just actually though, before we move off of this last point, I do want to say yeah. one thing. Just in terms of like the history, I actually think that a lot of this goes back to 9/11, right? And yes. financial controls that were put in place after 9/11, where you had money laundering become this sort of like standalone crime, mm -hmm. where it used to be only associated with like the underlying mm -hmm. activity, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's, we got to, we got to walk that back, right? We got to like financial privacy is not anybody's enemy, you know? And, but anyway, I just wanted to add that like Uki Dao. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I think that, that like the CFTC, broadly speaking, what the CFTC was, is trying to do in Uki Dao is anticipated, but um, I, I think it's kind of, I think that they're, they're kind of like doing Uki dirty, you know, like they, uh, mm -hmm. That we knew with with the when when DAO started to be, yeah. become a term, become like this quote unquote entity. There was a lot of lawyers, a lot of other people out there saying, "Hey, these are really um, you know unincorporated associations, general partnerships." And like the the big issue, right? When you compare an unincorporated association to a corporation LLC, what have you, is that the corporation, by reason of statute, limits the liabilities of the shareholders, of the members, right? So, and this is like actually a key feature of American capitalism, the idea of a corporation, because if you can have an entity in which you, only the capital that you put into that entity is at risk for the activities of that entity, that in and of itself encourages innovation. And I'm, um, so I'm not like an anti-corporate person, right? Because I think that a lot of the innovation that's happened in the United States 
actually is owed to the existence of corporations, right? And so what people, the, the, the deal with the devil that people made with, with, by forming DAOs that I think happened in Uki, right? Is they said, hey, this is a way of like distributing the control of this entity, but we didn't think about limiting liability, right? And Uki kind of jammed their thumb in the CFTC's eye, right? And I don't think they did it on purpose. I don't think anybody was out there being like, screw the government, right? They just said, if we organize as a DAO, then there's not going to be, it's going to be more difficult for us to get tagged by the CFTC. And like, you better believe the CFTC saw that and they were like, uh uh-uh. <laughs> that might be what you think. That's not what we think, right? And, and, and so when they sued the DAO, right, it's, it's, um, you know, they, they knew what was going to happen. They knew that the incentives were all messed up, right? Because their theory of liability for the DAO is if you act, not if you own the Uki token, but if you actually voted it in the DAO, then you're liable for the DAO's activities, which is kind of crazy because they're not saying if you voted it in favor of doing the illegal thing, right? You could have voted. voted. If you just yeah. voted it all, right? <laughs> then, you're, then you're liable for the activities of the DAO. And so nobody in their right mind, right? The incentives are not me, when me, Shaggy Defense, right? Like those are all my tokens. And so mm-hmm. they, 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 they knew when, when they did this lawsuit under this theory, they were gonna scare anybody out of showing up and saying, I am an Uki token holder, I represent the DAO because that mm-hmm. is financial suicide to, to, to do yeah. And so they knew they were going to get the default, and um, and and that's why we fought them in, in in the way that we did. Right? Is like the court did not understand what the government was asking it to do because from the court's perspective, all the government is saying is, "Hey, look, these guys organize themselves so they don't have an office. We can't figure out where to serve this complaint in California." And the judge is like, "Okay, serve it how you can." Right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. but like. And ultimately, the judge, Judge Oreck, I think, really did a good job of understanding the issues. And and I think, but I don't think he made the right decision, obviously, but ultimately he decided he kind of, like, because, and that's the other underhanded thing that the CFTC did, is like, they had already settled, right, with two individuals. And as part of that settlement, the individuals had to agree we're not going to have anything to do with Uki Dao on a go forward basis. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this came out in the hearing, right. That, that the CFTC had identified these people. And what the judge said is, okay, you know, two of the people serve them with the complaint. And it makes no sense though, because like, how are you going to serve the complaint on two people who have already agreed with the government? They're not involved with the Dao, you know? Uh Uh And, and so, you know, they filed for default last week. They're going to, I think we're probably going to do another amicus, more of more of a joint amicus when they actually enter the order. Because what I'm concerned about with the order is that, and this is an argument we raised in the case. It's like the CFTC needs to make rules about how FCM's registration applies to um, protocols like Uki. They need to do it. They haven't done. And, and this is what Summer uh, Mersinger said, who's a dissenting CFTC commissioner. Like, we have to make the rules to how we regulate these entities. And um, the when the, when when the the CFTC, if they're going to come in, and I think they are, and they're going to basically ask for an injunction for the court to issue against anybody who holds an Uki token or will hold an Uki token in the future. And it's so frustrating to me because it's like. That's rulemaking. You're you're, yeah. you're literally it's, stating a rule, right? But instead, that's not like, their mandate. Yeah, that's yeah, the executive it, agency. Yeah, and, and it, it's like you guys can make this rule under the Administrative Procedures Act. There's a way to do it with notice and comment, you know. But you're not doing that. You're asking a judge to do it for you, and it's maddening. But I think that the the bigger issue. Um, I don't even want to say the bigger issue, a corollary issue with the with the Uki case is they have a that you know people look at the CFTC and they say, well, that's the federal government. They're they're gonna turn square corners, right? They don't, but that's the the sort of assumption. Okay, 
But like, there are plenty of litigants in federal court that don't turn square corners, and they're just gonna go out there and try to make a quick buck off the defendants they see as fat, right? I mean, mm -hmm. patent trolls are like a, a sort of standard example of this. And what Judge Oreck has done in the Uki case is he has identified to, to all of these extractive plaintiffs, hey, this is an organization that you can pursue, right? And so, so if I'm one of the, if I'm like a plaintiff's lawyer, right, and I want to start, you know, getting money out of DeFi, right? What I'm looking for is a DAO, right, where I know through whatever forensics, looking at the chain, what, what, whatever, like who the who the members are, right? Mm -hmm. But I keep that piece of information close to my chest. I file a complaint against the DAO, right, and I tell the court. I don't know who these people are. Like it's fully anonymous, decentralized, autonomous organization. Like, I don't know who to serve the complaint. Look, we have this decision from Judge Orrick, respected judge, who says I can serve the complaint by posting it on their website, form, mm -hmm. in the telegram chat, whatever. And the judge said, there's no opposing party at that point. And the judge says, okay, yeah, it sounds reasonable. Um, and then you go through and like nowody appears, right? Because like on the Dow side, everybody's like a crap. Like, I don't want to appear. I don't want to be the guy who's on the hook. I don't want to be the guy. Yeah, yeah. And so then mm -hmm. this plaintiff gets a judgment against the Dow, right? And it says, hey, this is this is an unincorporated association. The individual members are liable. Now that I have my judgment, I go back to court and I say, hey, that's the guy. I knew, uh, you know, this is the guy. He owns the token. Here's why. Let me go after his assets. And, and, I, and I, I can almost guarantee we're going to see litigation like this. And it's going to be really it's gonna be dirty it's gonna be it, real dirty yeah it's gonna be real dirty and like wow. it kind of reminds me i don't know um this is kind of obscure but like way long time ago i got i was involved with the eff defending um copyright troll lawsuits and like i don't know if you guys were familiar with that but it was like this nasty practice where these plaintiffs lawyers would put porn on BitTorrent sites and then they would go and get the IP addresses of everybody who used the torrent. And then they'd file a, a John Doe complaint in federal court, right? Where they say, I'm filing this complaint against these like 5,000 different IP addresses. And before anybody appeared, they would ask the court to do discovery and they would serve subpoenas on the ISPs to say, who's the owner of these, of these IP addresses? And they would then send out these really scummy demand because it would just be the nastiest porn, you know, with like the grossest names, right? And they'd send these letters out to people that were like, on thus and such date, you downloaded like this horrible, like raunchy porn title, right? And they would, and they, and so many people, you know, they just wanted like a thousand bucks or like 1500 bucks. And so many people would just be like, yeah, get me out of it. I'll, I'll send you the $1,500, you know? And literal it, blackmail. Yeah, literal blackmail. Yeah, it, wow. Oh, years, years to, for the EFF to finally convince the district courts, you are being used in a blackmail scheme. And, and finally, like the guys who were doing it actually ended up going to prison. But, hmm. and so that seems like a good result, but it took literal years to get the court. Yeah, and all that and money and all that stress and all yeah. everything that comes with it. And, and so yeah. I see this, this situation involved, uh, you know, with Dow litigation, um, Kind of, it could start to look like that, right? Where like and the storm is coming. The storm is coming, yeah. And and so you know, I really do encourage anybody who's involved with a DAO, right, to think long and hard about how they're going to limit the liability for their for their token holders, right? And like, I think that yeah. it's, um, I, I do think that it's a problem in our industry, right? That you have some protocols that don't give a shit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And, and DAOs so, are in kind of this like, like go ahead, you can. I wanted to just to get some, you know, three things, Alex, that a DAO should do today, or rather yesterday, that they should have thought about or have done, or, or like, if you could only give them three things to do, what would they be? Yeah. So, so, so first is incorporate, right? Whether that's your Cayman Foundation or your Swiss, I think they call them stiff, stiff ones, something like that, stiff. Mm -hmm. in Switzerland, you know, it, it it's well worth it. And don't don't cut corners when you do your incorporation, right? Don't like the the other big mistake I see DAOs making is like, 
hey, we have our foundation. I got this piece of paper. You know, it says we got a foundation. So we got a foundation. That's not sufficient, right? Because you actually have to like do the work to make sure that the or the way the foundation is organized actually reflects the structure of how you operate. And so mm -hmm. um, that's the most important thing, right? Is because what's going to happen if these DAOs, if a DAO gets sued, right? And there is a foundation that's behind it is the first thing the plaintiff's going to say is, well, that's not really associated with, with the particular activity that I'm alleging the DAO is doing. So you need to have a DAO, uh, uh, an entity that actually encompasses all of the activities of, of the DAO, right? So you don't have that daylight um, for, for a plaintiff's attorney. Um, the other thing uh, that, I would, that I would do is think about indemnity, right? Because you have... Um, you know, an indemnity, this sounds really boring, right? It's like... Um, what is indemnity? Indemnity, yeah, what is so indemnity is when you agree to pay damages on behalf of another person, right? So, like, you can think about an insurance contract as an indemnity contract, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so, like, if you are a DAO, right, you need to think about how you're indemnifying your devs and your ops, right? And, and your admin, legal, whomever, right? Who's actually sort of operating the protocol. And you need to think about the extent to which you're gonna indemnify your token holders in the event of litigation, right? Because indem like what you really wanna be able to do is have a way that you can, if you get sued, that you can use the treasury, the money that belongs, the assets that belong to the, to the protocol to defend the protocol. Mm -hmm. And then in a certain sense, that is what the CFT, CFTC strategy in the Uki case is gutting, right? Uki has assets, right? But there is no way without putting individuals at tremendous risk that Uki can use its assets to defend itself against the government right now. And so by carefully thinking about and planning indemnity around both key persons and token holders, you can, you can create a, a way to allow those assets to be used to defend the DAO without putting any DAO members in danger, mm -hmm. right? And then, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess I, I'm going to say that's three, right? One, creating yeah, the good. entity. Two, using the entity correctly. And three, mm -hmm. using using the entity to indemnify the individuals and make sure that that people themselves are not. And, and for the identification, uh, like, do the DAO members need to essentially like dox themselves to sign the contract, or like, what? What are the? Is there a yeah, blanket that's, way that's to indemnify? That's very complicated, right? And I think that that like there are. If I'm a member of a DAO in the sense that I'm a token holder, am I better off? Because you do have to dox, right? There's not really another way to do it, right? I mean, maybe there are other ways to do it that I just haven't thought of. But in my mind, it kind of requires being doxed, right? And so, you know, what, if you from the perspective of the DAO member, right? Am I better off doxing and entering this agreement with the, with the protocol, or making sure that I've covered my tracks and I'm fully and on, so that I'm not actually going to get tagged if if something goes down? And I think that where we stand today, because we and really people like me have not figured out the right way to do this, um, I think you're still better off going the Anon route, but that's a lot harder for the key persons, right? Who are like, the, I mean, some devs are just going to stay Anon no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. and they're like, look, I can code Solidity. If you want my identity, that's fine. There's a dozen other guys out there who don't want my identity who are going to pay me for the same code. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and I do think that there is uh, right now some, some safety in, in being anonymous. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But to the extent that um, you're, you're not anonymous or you're concerned that you won't, um, that whatever steps you've taken to protect your identity are not going to be foolproof, then you do need to come to like an understanding of what the relationship is between yourself and, and the DAO. And, you know, I do think that like, there are ways that the DAO, a DAO can do this, right? Where they say, okay, if you hold X number of tokens and you're like named as a defendant in a lawsuit alongside the DAO, then you'll be indemnified, you know, 
what what have you. But but it's uh, it's it, there's definitely not a right answer for this right now. It's still something that's very sort of nascent, and we kind of have to wait and see like what happens with the litigation for what the best practice. Wow. Yeah, whether it's DAOs or DeFi or even NFTs, we're still trying to have those regulations, frameworks, and laws defined so we can function in this new and exciting space without as much worry and anxiety. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And on that note, um, do you have any more questions or did you want to do the, the lightning round now? Yeah, let's do the lightning round. But uh, before we jump in, I just want to say, uh, Alex, thanks so much for kind of coming on and yeah. sharing all these uh, war stories almost with us. And um, I, I don't know if I'm more anxious now or before the call, uh, <laughs> being a yeah, member of I, a DAO. <laughs> As, as oh. someone that I feel like if I wasn't in crypto and like something like I realized in crypto is like, I'm really interested in securities law and exactly like this. Like, I feel like I would be a lawyer's lawyer, honestly. Um, <laughs> cause I'm just like, is, cause it's such a gray area and like the whole interpretation of it is fun. So like I enjoy oh, yeah. conversation like these and, you know, seeing like what, where, where do like certain things lie? And it's just like, not, it is clear, but it's not clear. So this is a lot of fun. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to come on here with you guys as well. I yeah. mean, it's, it's really, it's really nice for me, uh, from my perspective as an attorney to like have a conversation with non-attorneys who have also like thought very hard about these same issues and like, yeah, it's just a great exchange of ideas. I'm very, very appreciative. Of yeah. It's a good mix. It's exactly like you said, like attorney, non-attorney, like we think about these ideas in, in like a different context than you do. Who's like in like the in the trenches, the legal trenches, in the courts and whatnot. Yeah, I, I mean, I I do think about it and then like, for a split second and then I put it back into a dark corner in my mind that I don't try to think about it again. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. and, uh, Alex, so at the end of all these pods, we usually run through a series of questions just to kind of get you to know you better as a, a human, you know? So okay. first question is, what was your uh, virgin crypto experience? When did you first touch the chain and sexes don't count um okay this is gonna out me as as like as like kind, kind of a newcomer because like i i bought some bitcoin on a, on a sex and then fumbled the bag like you know like very early <laughs> on uh, i don't even want to say what price i bought bitcoin at and what price I sold it at, but that was that was a different time honestly my first like on chain like education of of like Hey, how does Ethereum actually work? And like, I'm gonna self custody all that. It was own fork season, man. So not that long ago, you know. Ooh. Like I, I, I was like, I was, I was very enamored with the, with the whole Olympus DAO, like everything they were doing, and uh, managed managed not to actually get burned. You know, I got, I saw what was happening. Nine nine, <laughs> nine nine. <laughs> yeah, nine, nine. I mean, and, and uh, uh, so 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 yeah, it was. Uh, I, I, I gotta admit, I practiced law in the area for for like a long time before I ever actually like like touched mm. stuff, which is uh, um, I, I think something that lawyers do a lot and probably shouldn't, right? You should probably have your, yeah. hand, get your hands a little dirty yeah. before you start telling people how to do it, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. And then a uh, second question follow up is, what is your favorite off chain touch grass activity? What are hobbies and interests of yours? So, 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 so unfortunately I've fallen off of it a little bit cause I've moved back from the Caribbean, but honestly, my favorite, my favorite thing to do is open water swimming. I used to, I used to just go when I lived on St. Thomas, there's so many of these beautiful beaches and you can just like swim for miles and just like put everything else out of your brain. You just like, I'm not a fast swimmer, but I would just sit there for, for hours of time, just kind of swimming along. Marathon but, swimmer. What's that? I wow. said a marathon. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so my I, and there are definitely people who swim farther than I do. But my longest race was five miles, which was like wow. Yeah, it was quite a swim. It was yeah. uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a uh, it, it, they call it. It's a race on Saint Croix. They call it the Buck to Buck. There's a island <laughs> there's there's a there's a hotel on the island called the Buccaneer and an island called Buck Island. And you swim from Buck Island to the Buccaneer. So you are swimming across like open ocean, can't see the bottom, you know, just wow. like you in the water. You know, it's crazy. It, it is a cool experience though. Wow. Wow. So what is some advice you would give to your younger self? Um, just like, don't, um, 
don't don't get hung up on on grades and status and 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 all that. Like you know, I'm I'm 41 now. I I you know obviously went to undergrad, went to law school, did, did all that stuff, and like was never good at it. I was never good at school, and it caused me like no end of like consternation. Like, am I good enough? Am I like a pretender? You know, and and I never got a look at from like I never worked at a big law firm. Nobody ever told me like in the traditional like status sense, like, yeah, you're doing this right. And the thing is like, none of that shit matters. Like mm-hmm. what matters is like, from the perspective of practicing law, my, what my clients think about me, that's it. Mm-hmm. And they don't that's care. It. They don't care yeah. like where, what my grades were, where I went to law school. If other lawyers like me, you know, it's, it's just like going out and like the jobs, what's important, like doing the things is, is what's important. And as long as mm-hmm. you do that, you're okay. Amen. Okay. And uh, the last question here uh, before we sign off is if you weren't in crypto and you weren't in law, what career path would you be on right now? That's a tough one, man. I'd probably sell weed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not even joking, right? Because I went to college. I started undergrad in 1999. I went to college in Portland, Oregon, graduated in 2003. Like, so many of my buddies, you know, went from like mm. selling bags in college to like being the guys who are like running fucking dispensaries and everything. Right. And like, honestly, if I didn't go in, that was my world. Right. So if I didn't go into practicing law, that's, that's probably what I would have, what I would have. Especially, yeah. Especially yeah. out in Oregon. But yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, I mean, enough time has passed that I can say this, but I love growing weed. Like it's, it's like, I mean, I like <laughs> plants in general and like weed plants are just fascinating plants. And it's always something that, I like to do. So I think if, if, if I, I kind of always knew I was going to law school, but if I hadn't done it, I, I'm pretty sure that's where I would have ended up. A okay. Botanist. What would the name of your dispensary be? 10 seconds. Go. Oh, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't sell weed because I can't think of the name of a dispensary. <laughs> what, what is your favorite strain to smoke? Uh so I don't get too caught up on strains to be to, oh, okay. to, to be honest. Like like I know like honestly like <laughs> this is so old school. But like I think about strains like oh yeah it's it's that shit like my homie so and so grew like you know like yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, like last yeah, summer yeah. or whatever like it's it's like so like um, I think like the 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 coolest strain I ever saw was like this and I haven't seen it recently but. And I think there's a lot like this now, but but it was called like White Widow because it had all the oh yeah, you know? and it's just like it's really pretty, you know. It's really like mm-hmm. it's like a beautiful like you look at the bud and you're like that's yeah. beautiful, you know. You almost don't want to smoke it, yeah. but like yeah, that's yeah. A, it's it's not always like the weed that looks the best is not doesn't always give you the, yeah. it's not always the best, you know. Yeah, what is your preferred way to smoke? Is it do you like to roll up J's? Yeah, like, I usually yeah. like me too. Me too. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a joint guy. I used to be a blunt yeah. guy, but mm-hmm. it, it's too hard it's on my hard. lungs now. So I no, yeah. I, I find rolling J's being such a meditative experience. Yes. Like you know, talk, talk about like putting everything out of, out of your head. Like all you're focusing on is like getting the perfect roll. Yeah, so that's enjoy. And honestly, like I prefer like mid weed. Unpopular opinion. Like I don't like my weed too strong. I just like a little mm-hmm. bit of a high. Because otherwise, yeah. if it's like too much, it's just like literally too strong. And like the way American weed industry has you know evolved over the past several decades, it's like let's make it stronger and stronger and oh. stronger. Yeah, and like now, it's yeah. not as un- an unpopular opinion as you would think. I think it's just the industry is kind of like yeah, forty percent, forty five percent. But it's yeah. like most people don't like the experience of being too high is actually like extremely unpleasant. Terrible. It is. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And now. Yeah, but it's cool that we're at a, like a point in ours American zeitgeist that we can just talk about. That. We can just talk yeah, about it yeah. on a podcast. Yeah, on a podcast. Podcast. I love it that we just met and we're on a podcast. Yeah, and you're like I'm going yeah, to so into. My public service announcement. I'm going to eat Denver. So if anybody wants to like roll me J's, like I, <laughs> I, I, I want to, you know, I, I accept. <laughs> Flywheel DeFi Dave taking J donations. Smoke, smoke the, yeah. <laughs> or if anybody wants to like smoke, you know, I'll roll up too. Uh, well, smoke, uh, <laughs> smoke with DeFi good. Dave. <laughs> that will be the next, next event. Yeah. Alex, okay. I think that was and my I, favorite answer to the career question that I've heard so far in this pod. Thank you for yeah. that. 
It gave me a good laugh. <laughs> it's yeah. a proof. What you know? It's yeah. like uh, you, you did kind of catch me a little. I hadn't thought about it before, but when I was forced, yeah. to, it's like that's the that first thing that came. Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Alex. Thanks so much for coming on. We hope to see you again soon, and best of luck in all your legal endeavors. Thank you guys so much. Love the podcast. Come on. I'd be. Lo- I'd love to come back. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching this episode of Flywheel. We had Alex, the chief legal officer of Umami Labs on, talking everything law and legal and the landscape of crypto. Kit, final thoughts on this episode. As a member of a lot of DAOs, I'm sweating a little bit. Um, and <laughs> I really do hope my uh, DAO leaders kind of take this uh, pod to heart and really think deeply mm-hmm. about how to protect the DAO members. Because I, I think it's... It's it's one of those things that I just feel is in, inevitable and it's like it's coming, it's going yeah. to come, and I don't want to be amongst the one that got hit, you know? Yeah, I think whether it's DAOs or DeFi, you have like mm. these time horizons coming, these you know, legal regulatory time horizons coming, and it's really a matter of, you know, the crypto industry and the different subsets of the crypto industry preparing properly and getting ready for these time horizons. And I think DeFi has done a good job preparing, um, you know, actively lobbying in Congress, like whether it's through the Coin Center or Blockchain Association, this and that. I'm not sure if DAOs have done the same thing. I don't think DAO people have like thought deeply about this. And like, there's, you don't really hear many, much conversation in that regard. And that is concerning, but I'm hoping like, you know, Alex getting out there talking about it, you know, I hope more people bring it up on social media. It is something worth talking about because it affects everyone in crypto who's in a DAO. Yeah, 100%. And it's you guys, our listeners too, our dear listeners. Yeah. Please, you know, ask your DAO leaders and and DAO members to see if they've even thought about this topic and how yeah. you're protecting yourself. Yeah, it's it's quite concerning, but it's nothing that we can't overcome. And you know, he did give us like you know some ways, some solutions here and there, but we'll see. It's one of those things. We'll see how, what happens, and we'll see how it plays out. And if 100%. you want to catch up. And if you want to see how every episode plays out from now and into the future, make sure you hit that bell button, subscribe on YouTube, leave us a comment, give us a like, because we know we, we really like these episodes. We really do. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at FlywheelFi. Make sure you follow us, uh, you know, hit us up on Telegram, join our Telegram group at FlywheelFi. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at DeFiDave22. And you can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And we'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. Everything said on this episode is not financial or tax advice. This channel is strictly for educational purposes and is not in investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any assets or to make any financial decisions. This video is not tax advice whatsoever. Please talk to your accountant and do your own research.